all of us. It's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I've got Eric Ashey, Chief Marketing and Strategy Officer for Truth Initiative. Truth Initiative is America's largest nonprofit public health organization dedicated to making tobacco use a thing of the past. Eric leads all the marketing efforts, including Truth, which is ubiquitous in pop culture and was named one of the top campaigns of the 21st century by Ad Age. On the show today, we go behind that success, really try to understand how is the marketing mix changing for an organization that tries to get people not to do something versus most marketers try to get us to do something. We also talk about some innovative ways that they're reaching younger people today, as well as developing products and event marketing for an organization that is a cause more than a product. Developing products is something unique. And lastly, it wouldn't be marketing today if we didn't Go behind the scenes to understand Eric a little bit more and his three young boys and what that's like being a father. I hope you enjoy the show. Well, Eric, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. So tell us a little bit about your path to the Truth Initiative and your current role as Chief Marketing and Strategy Officer. Well, I would say, you know, I kind of found my way into this position through the for-profit world. I didn't start off my career as a social justice crusader. And and I I certainly didn't think of myself as a a non-profit guy. But over the years, I've have certainly found my voice in the social justice space and and certainly have developed a a passion or lens for doing work that, that not only is good on the merit of the work itself, but also that has a positive impact on the environment and the people around us. And so I I come from your traditional or stereotypical sort of marketing background. I was on the client side and on the agency side. I worked for a startup in Austin during the dot-com boom and bust (laughs) and (laughs) went back into the agency world. And Truth was one of my clients, as fate would have it. And I was working with them off and on for a couple of years. And a senior position in the marketing department opened up in DC. I happened to be living in Austin, Texas at the time and thought I would never move. I'd love Austin and was working for GSDNM, a, a great ad agency there in town and had a great life in Austin. And the thought of moving to DC to work for a nonprofit was just outside of anything that I thought I would consider. But the prospect of being able to shape and change people's lives and impact the death rate due to cancer as a result of the scourge of tobacco was just so compelling that some, it was an opportunity I couldn't pass up. And so I came here thinking I would be at Truth for a year, maybe two years, and it's been over 11 years now. <laughs> it's been quite a ride. That's fun. That's fun. Well, so Truth has won just about every industry award for its campaigns. You know, Effie's, Clio's, Lions, and many more. What do you think contributes to that success for both the organization, but also the marketing that you're doing? Yeah, no pressure, right? What do you do for right. an encore? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, we have we've been really fortunate to be recognized by our peers and by the industry for the amazing work we've contributed to the field over the years. I, I should say at the onset, I get to take credit for this work, but I stand on the shoulders of men and women who made some really difficult choices and showed a lot of bravery, particularly in the early years when we launched in the early two thousands. And so I as I will take credit for it on this podcast, I just know I recognize I didn't develop the original insight in the brand and I am more a caretaker of, of the brand today. You know, I think one of the things that has led to our success has been a zealous focus on the consumer. And if you look at our board of directors, we have a lot of very powerful, influential people on the board, various governors and attorneys general uh, from different states who you wouldn't think on the surface would necessarily have their finger on the pulse of pop culture. But what they have enabled us to do and have empowered us to do from the top down, from the board down, is to make decisions that are based on what we think will have an impact on the consumer. And we have a very rigorous process in terms of how we understand social currency, pop culture, 
how to navigate in a very crowded consumer landscape to have an impact on the way people think and behave. And so having that track record of success certainly helps engender trust from our board and our CEO. But it, it stems from this belief that if we are going to make an impact, we have to serve the consumer and we have to check our bias at the door. And a lot of brands and marketers talk about that, but it's very, very hard to consistently live in that space. And you can think of other brands that have potentially lost their way in doing that. But year over year, campaign over campaign, we've been able to maintain our focus on the consumer and what they need to hear from us to make an informed choice. And I think that's ultimately led to our success over time. Interesting. Interesting. And, and so I remember a previous conversation with you, we were talking about, you know, the goal of your advertising is ultimately to get people not to do something which is very different than most marketers' jobs of trying to get the consumer to, to actually do something. Yeah. Do you see, is there any difference in the way you approach the job, you know, having been on the agency side and other organizations before? Yeah, there are some differences. I mean, you would be surprised at the similarities. I, I mean, we think about and approach our job through the same lens of, a, of any market. We're competing for market share. And so when you look at our competition, the tobacco industry, just to put this in perspective, they lose every single day 1,200 of their most loyal customers every single day. So that's 1,200 people in the U.S. die every single day of a tobacco-related disease. That's an astonishing number. And so if you think about their business model, just to break even, they have to replace 1,200 of their most loyal customers every day. And so we are competing aggressively for that market share. Now, we are outspent dramatically. They, the tobacco industry in aggregate in the U.S., they spend in a day what we probably spend in a year. They've been in the marketplace for decades before us. They have extremely powerful brands. And they have a product that's legal and addictive. And so <laughs> they have a lot going for them. They have distribution on almost every street corner in the country. <laughs> Those are easy odds, right? Those are easy odds, right. And so we have something that they can't buy, though. We have the moral high ground, and I firmly believe that. We have the merit of the argument is on our side. I firmly believe that. And we have the truth, and we don't take that lightly. And there's a great responsibility with that. So we do have, we are this David and Goliath sort of contrast. But for us, the way we think about competing, we can't solely rest on the moral high ground because that's not the reason why individuals make this type of decision. And so for us to have an impact on that buying behavior, to use a, you know, sort of a marketing lens, we have to compete and understand how the tobacco industry is positioning themselves in the marketplace the role the product plays in the consumer's life. And then we have to compete with something that's better. And that's really the challenge in front of us. We have our own purchase funnel. We think about the audience through a segmentation lens, very rigorous evaluation, but we are competing for that market share. And so to your point, at the end of the funnel for us, it's less about trial and initiation, and it's more about abstinence. And that's where our success in the messaging is deconstructed in a way of how do we drive a wedge in the mind of the consumer so they are not susceptible to trying the product, which is very different in terms of the outcome from a traditional marketer. But we use the exact same discipline and rigor that goes into sort of a traditional, a traditional funnel. Hmm. Well, so I know you mentioned to me as well that smoking is at historically low levels. You know, so what challenge does that present to you? And uh, you know, how do you have to adapt to reach the smaller and smaller audience? That's a great question. It's a wonderful problem to have. You know, we jokingly talk about what success looks like for us. And ultimately, success would be that we work ourselves out of a job. And I would love nothing more than to be in a position next year, three years from now, five years from now, whatever that looks like to have the scourge of tobacco and the death and destruction be something that's in our rear view mirror. I think as the number goes down, I think the challenge for us becomes, you know, how do you look at the pockets where tobacco is still more entrenched than others? And so if you look at the sort of the national rates, what you'll see this probably won't surprise you, the rates sort of in the, the highly populated areas where you have 
a lot of clean indoor air laws enacted. It's harder to smoke in bars and restaurants and whatnot. Taxes are in place. The smoking rates are very, very low. Your coastal areas, smoking is very, very low. But when you look at what we're calling tobacco nations, so think more the middle of the, the United States and the southeast and southwest, mm-hmm. smoking rates are extremely high. In fact, if you were to take that portion of the country and compare that with the rest of the world, we're in the top 10 most highest populated or densely smoked area. So we're on par with places like China and India and other parts of the world where you think of their health policy around smoking lagging behind significantly. And so to put it into perspective, there are definite pockets of areas across the US where we've done a tremendous job at driving down the smoking rates. But when you look at places like what we're calling Tobacco Nation, there's still a ton of work to be done. And so for us, The question is going to be, how do you continue to make a brand relevant on this issue when the reasons why they smoke are going to vary by culture and by race and ethnicity, in some cases more nuanced reasons in terms of their background and where they live and their location. I think that's where we have to add variety over time. We have to diversify our product, so to speak, to make sure we're continuing to have an impact there. Great. So I remember, you know, of all the ads that you've done, I think I probably remember the scary ads the most, the the body bags and things like that from my youth, you know, but as I was doing my research for this interview, I didn't know all the pop culture messages that you have from dating messages and how smoking can, can really ruin your, ruin your dating life to pets and cat videos and all kinds of things. I know I'm not the target for those. You just dated yourself. You just I know, dated yourself. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I, I'm, it's a fact of life. I, I can't get younger. How do these play into your overall marketing mix? How do you know what's, what's working of all the things that you've been doing? Well, we start from, it's a great question. And we thank you for uh, doing your research on us there and pulling out the cat video and uh, dating <laughs> yeah. reference. It's, it's a good homework. I, you know, we start from a position of really being honest with ourselves that if we're there's no 16 year old in the country right now sitting on the edge of their couch in the living room saying my life would be complete if i just had another truth video (laughs) you know there's we realize we are not top of mind our issue is not top of mind and i think we have to go in with the assumption that people just don't care about this issue there's not a lot of momentum behind the issue and we have to create that momentum and it's a mistake for us even with all the success that we've had as a brand and all the accolades that we've received we still start from the position to borrow language from roy spence at gsdnm we assume we are an uninvited guest in their lives and so i think that is an incredibly healthy place for us to start Because then we don't take for granted that someone is going to pay attention to us. People will not engage with us just because we are a quote unquote, do good brand. And so if you start from the position of, we have to make ourselves an invited guest, go from an uninvited guest to someone they want to interact with. If you start from that perspective, you begin the conversation with how do I make myself relevant to this consumer? And that's how you end up talking about things that they care about because I'm not taking a position, an arrogant position to say my brand is so important or my issue is so important that people are automatically going to default to have a conversation with me. I start from the position of I'm going to have to entertain you. I'm going to have to pull you in in some way, shape or form, make an emotional connection to you take an issue that you don't care about and show you why you should care about this. And the way we do that in the the cat videos is an example. Dating is an example. Smoking impacts all of those things that you really care about. You just don't see how the dots are connected. So as a brand, what we've tried to do is look for momentum and culture. Where's the conversation happening? What technology is popular of the moment? Why is it popular? What utility does this culture or does this technology actually play? And then our job, my job is to figure out what are the dots that connect it back to something I care about and create that relevancy, sort of that Venn diagram overlap. And then we do it in a way that's going to be entertaining in some cases, but, but we need to reward the consumer for paying attention to us. And so that's sort of our strategy in terms of how we hope to leverage culture in a way that gives us a chance to have an ongoing conversation. 
So as I was doing that research, I also noticed you're doing a bunch of events and even creating real products for events like the Vans Warp Tour and the Cotopaxi Questables. And there, it looks like you've got a collaboration with a guy named Kevin Lyons. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about Kevin and why did that make sense for him and you? Yeah, that's a good pull. You know, we sort of believe have this belief or I have this belief that Brands are really only real to a certain degree if they're, they're they have some sort of a physical presence in the world, at least in as related to our competition. And so, again, if we are just this idea, this brand that stands for the way you think and the way that you evaluate your environment and the role that companies have with consumers, that's important, and it's important to win the minds of the consumer, but. I'm still competing with this brand that has a tangible product on every street corner. And so for us, we really want to have tangible assets that people can hang on to, they can brand themselves with, they can experience the brand in their world and in their community. It just It's not just a brand that exists on YouTube or in Snapchat or the various channels. And so that's one of the reasons why we think it's very, very important for us to have a physical presence because, again, we're competing for those hearts and minds that market share on the ground in real places. And so if you kind of come in with that bias, question is how do you do that in a way that's really relevant when – I don't have a car for you to go test drive. I don't have a retail location for you to go experience in an environment. I don't have a a new latte that's coming out that's seasonal to get you to go try. So we are dependent upon finding these relationships and these brands that have a shared value system, but also have those assets that allow us to have that presence. And so that's what led us down the pathway of doing the partnership with Cotopaxi and doing a partnership with Vans. It really was through this desire to to have that physical presence. And Vans in particular, we were working with a gentleman there at Vans named Doug Palladini, who's been there for a while, and he has a lot of heart for our issue. He's a really solid guy. And, you know, Vans occupies as a brand a really unique position in the consumer's mind. It's about freedom of expression, it's about pushing your limits, it's about, you know, no boundaries, among other things. And We felt like there was a lot of overlap with what Vans was standing for, this craving for independence and the truth brand. And we also sort of felt like for us to have a collaboration, we wanted to bring an artist to the table to sort of help bring that to life in a way that was unique and would add some credibility. And Kevin Lyons, we've been a fan of his for a long time. And I know Doug has been a personal fan of his. He's really well known in the street art and uh, street and skate culture. And he has an advertising background as well. We reached out to him and he quickly was like, I would love to, I would love to engage with you guys. And so that led to a collaboration where he developed the design of the shoe and he did several murals for us. And we did a lot of work around sort of telling the story of, of how and why Kevin was engaged with us. Then we were able to produce the shoe. We got mass distribution through journeys and malls across America. And it's a, it's been a really wonderful partnership and sort of a model for us of, of how if we can bring in other voices, you know, we drove great affinity for Vans. They got a lot of cred from consumers for doing the right thing and standing next to us. And then for us, you know, it goes back to the comment I made earlier, to have a tangible product, our brand plus truth in the marketplace is an incredible win for us because we want the consumer to take truth and take our message with them. And if a kid spends money and brands themselves with a Truth logo or Truth and Vans logo, that, that's the highest compliment we could possibly have. Right, right. Well, and uh, the Cotopaxi in particular, I've had Davis, the founder from Cotopaxi on. And I mean, you talk about another purpose-driven organization. I don't think you can get more purpose-driven. Well, I'm talking to someone that's probably more purpose driven than they should (laughs) stop myself. But I mean, I am just in all of Cotopaxi and what they're doing. Yeah. They're a solid business plan. I mean, if you look at their background, I'm a, I'm a fan of theirs as well, just in terms of his own personal track record of success and his personal story is really compelling. It's a genuine desire to make an impact and to change people's lives. And I think for us, that when we first started talking to Davis and his team, the answer before we could even complete the sentence was, of course, we're going to work together. Uh, It just is so obvious. We just got to figure out how does it work for both parties. And I think that's an interesting model for us as a brand. You know, Cotopaxi is not the same size and scale of some other 
players in their space, but what they bring is an authenticity and a with a brand like Truth, that's extremely important. There's an expectation that the people that we stand next to are going to be doing this for the right reason. And there's an expectation on our behalf as well that people are going to be supporting the mission and who we are in an earnest way. And so, yeah, I think you know those two examples are great models for us in terms of how we intersect on issues they care about. The consumer can look at those partnerships and say, that makes a ton of sense. I understand why that's happening. And we want to feel good about it. We want the organization to feel good about it. And ultimately, Cotopaxi and Vans, they are businesses that need to make a profit. And so we also understand when we go into these partnerships that it's not just about doing good for the sake of doing good. It's about doing good. That also leads to a higher degree of commerce exchange. And so we realize that. And we fully believe that the burden is on us to show how we can improve their bottom line while they are doing good in the marketplace. And I think brands like Cotopaxi obviously have their finger on the pulse of they're very comfortable navigating that space. And But yeah, it's a long way of saying we're, we're thrilled with those types of partnerships as well. Well, so let's take on the tobacco industry a little bit. I know during the Grammys this year, earlier in the year, you took on the industry profiling them, you know, essentially profiling people disguised as targeted marketing. And then you took it a, a step further with the MTV VMAs, where you actually called them out for the exploitation of the mentally ill in the military. Now, before I became a marketer, I experienced what you guys referenced in in the so-called air quote, you know, quote unquote, self-medication language. I was interning at psychiatric facilities. For some reason, I thought I wanted to be a clinical psychologist at one point in my life. Some might say I still do that just behind a microphone. I don't know, but we'll see. (laughs) Uh, But I experienced that whole language of, you know, well, tobacco use was extremely prevalent, especially among the patients that were experiencing deep psychosis or schizophrenia. You know, so it's definitely marketing gone awry when they're doling out free cigarettes to psychiatric facilities. As you guys dug into this, how does that even take place? How does it get started? Yeah, it's a, you know, the tobacco industry has a long and well-documented track record of systematically targeting people that are vulnerable. And so what they've been able to identify is that in one way, shape, or form, if you're part of a community that is under stress, that is marginalized, whether you self-identify with that community or not, you are easy prey for them. And they use that type of language where their product, because of the way they position it, it's positioned as a shortcut to freedom, to access, to living a fuller life. And if you think about the way they've advertised and positioned themselves through some of their advertising, if you think back to some of their classic ads, this is a way that you can have all the good things in life, right? You can express yourself. And what they weren't telling you was it was arguably the most addictive product that man has ever created. And so if you have a lens where your acquisition model is really looking for people who are struggling in one shape or form, you can imagine all of the different pockets of individuals that rise to the surface. And they have historically gone after the African-American community aggressively. They have historically gone after women. They've gone after the military. They've gone after the LGBTQ community. They've gone after, to your point, the mentally challenged or mentally ill. And so it fits into a larger narrative for them. They're not, they are concerned about getting people that they see as easy prey and the terminology that they have used historically in their internal documents is disparaging. And our belief has been if we share that information with people, if we just tell them the truth about what is being said behind closed doors or what has been said over the years behind closed doors, that they will begin to think differently about the company that is producing this product, which will lead to them not using the product as much. So in in other words, it will lead to prevention. And that's been a well-documented strategy that's worked for us. Well, so let's hope that you're successful with truth and that smoking ends forever. So I'm rooting for you and the organization. Here, here. <laughs> Thank you. Let's assume that that does happen though. Where does truth go next? It's a good question. You know, our we have a lot of work to be done. You know, we're looking at the numbers in terms of the vaping community, and it's it's a very difficult landscape to navigate. But those numbers continue to increase. We are concerned that that would lead to 
a whole new cohort of youth and young adults who are addicted to nicotine. Does that translate into cigarette use? It's unclear. And then we also were, you know, we're trying to think through like what are other issues that overlap with tobacco that go hand in hand. And so our mandate does allow us to talk about and deal with other issues. But right now we are obviously solely focused on tobacco because the death toll from tobacco is still 400,000 plus Americans each year dying from tobacco use. And so whether we focus on prevention for youth and young adults or we focus more exclusively on cessation or we focus on the new product development, the death toll is still extremely high. And so I think for us, it would be a mistake to think because we're having such high success with the youth initiation rates that our work is done. We still have a tremendous amount of work ahead of us. It may just mean that the Truth brand will need to evolve a little bit to talk to different target audiences to make sure we can slow down the death toll from tobacco. Okay, good. Fair enough. So now stepping back from tobacco and from truth, it's really important to me to understand the person behind the marketing. And I think listeners enjoy this part as well. And I love this question that I ask, which is what experience of your past do you think defines or makes up who you've become? Wow. That's a really weighty question. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, maybe I am a shrink behind the microphone. We'll see. Yeah. 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 So it's interesting. There are lots of examples that immediately come to mind mainly the mistakes I've made where people showed me incredible grace and patience, times in my career where I thought I should have been fired and people didn't fire me, which led to some incredible learning and experiences. But I'd have to say, I think what's it's probably the position I'm currently in right now being a father. I have a, a five-year-old, a four-year-old, and a not-yet-two-year-old in my house, all boys. If you're doing the math, that's a lot of kids in a short amount of time. <laughs> and I didn't have my first son until I was, let's see, late 30s. Maybe I was 40 when I had my first son. So later in my life compared to a lot of my peers and friends. And I would say having children has been transformative in the way that I view my vocation and the way that I view my work and my life and the commingling of those two entities. And I'm not sure I'll do it justice by answering your question, but I will say that if, if anyone has kids, they probably experience this. And I don't think it's this sort of lesson for me has is only relevant if you have children. But I find myself in my behavior at the office thinking, if my kids were here and they will show up at the office from time to time and they were to sit in on this meeting, would they say, oh, I know that guy, that's daddy? Or would they say, who is that guy? And vice versa, if the people that I work with were to see me at home with my family and my kids, would they say, who, who is that guy? Granted, I would be using you know, the baby voice, which I, won't, I will not <laughs> offer up the baby voice on this podcast. But I think the lesson for me has been, I really want to be transparent on both sides of the equation. And I really want to be consistent in my values and how I treat people. And I think I would have always... I think I would have said that years ago, but I think the feedback loop looks much different with small kids. And I want my kids to be proud of what I do. And I don't think that you have to work for a nonprofit to have that goal in mind, but it certainly helps when you're part of a mission-driven organization. But I want my kids to be able to look at the work, the contribution, the people that I've invested time in, with here at the office and outside of the office and some of the, the other volunteer work I do, I really want to leave a legacy for them and an, a model for them. I really feel the burden of modeling for my kids what it means to be a leader, particularly in times that are so difficult to navigate that we live in today. And I think that to me, I feel like the learning curve for me since I've had kids on that point in particular has just been transformative. And so there are other probably examples I could give you in terms of lesson learned that are uh, or things I've experienced that have impacted my career to get me to where I am, but I don't think there's anything that I'm quite feeling as much joy from and as much frustration and failure from quite candidly as this how do I live a holistic life with small kids who are seen into my world. It's incredibly challenging but rewarding at the same time. Right. Right. So you've got a couple more kids to go before you have the 
basketball team. Oh my gosh. I just, I'm too tired. I'm, I'm so, no, I drink copious amounts of, co- I'm single handedly keeping the coffee industry afloat. Okay. All right. Well, uh, what fuels you, what drives you behind besides the coffee? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Besides the coffee. Yeah. I think continuing that theme, you know, I love hard challenges and I love, I'm not somebody who who thrives in managing an existing process. That's part of every job. But I think if you, you know, we're chasing as a brand, the truth brand is chasing youth and young adults. So we're chasing the 18 to 24, 15 to 24 year old market. And if you're looking for a status quo audience, that is the wrong audience to be focused on. And I get a ton of energy from that relentless pursuit of reaching the audience. And it's driven by technology, it's driven by culture, it's driven by so many things. But that cracking the code, solving the hard problems, maintaining relevancy with arguably the most fickle audience on the planet is life-giving to me. I love that. I also love working with and investing in people. And I think that's also something that has evolved as I've become a father, I get an incredible amount of joy from the success of the people on my team. And and that's something if you had told me 15, 20 years ago, the amount of satisfaction I would have by being part of a team and seeing other people thrive and get the credit and it not be all about me, I don't think I would have understood that. But some of my proudest moments and accomplishments here at Truth, they aren't the can lines and they aren't the effies and they aren't all of that success. It's the individuals and I can think of them by name and what they've gone on to do and to see them grow and be leaders and contribute in their families and in society and their jobs, that is incredibly rewarding. And that the opportunity to be able to pour into other people and to help shape how they work and how shape them as people, that's incredibly empowering to me. I would wither up and die if I had to work in a vacuum and be on an island by myself and be an independent operator. I thoroughly enjoy working with and collaborating in, in sort of the team dynamic. Great. Well, so I tend to find that marketers are students of marketing and students of other businesses out there. You know, are there brands or companies that you follow or you think others should be taking notice of? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I I love the work Adidas is doing. I'm a, just the way the role and the posture they're taking in culture, the narrative they're portraying, the boldness. I'm a huge fan. I'm watching what they're doing. Levi's, obviously a massive massive brand that has an incredibly impactful social footprint. I love the brands like Cotapaxi and the B Corps, like Warby Parker. I love Kind. You know, we've been looking at Kind to understand what they're doing, and then I'm also, I mean, I'm really intrigued by what's going on at the Washington Post. I mean, obviously they're in our own backyard, but I, they have just gone through such a resurgence and transformation over the past several years, and the role they are playing in culture and the role they are playing in terms of telling the truth and doing their best to tell the truth, but also leveraging data in a way that I think is really going to change that brand over time and the role that they play over time. I'm really intrigued on how they will emerge, not just out of this tension that I think is fueling a lot of interest in them right now, but what that will look like for them over time. (laughs) How will they sustain the growth? How will they keep youth and young adults who are tuning into the Washington Post for the first time, how will they keep them engaged? I think there will be a lot of lessons learned based on you know who owns them and how they leverage data and technology to really meet the consumer's demand. And I think that they will have an interesting playbook for all of us. It's a sort of a non-traditional probably answer to your question, but they are certainly a brand on the rise. And I'm very intrigued and impressed by what they're doing. That's good. I, I'm going to have to dig a little deeper on that. So last question for you is, you know, what do you think the future of marketing is going to look like? Piece of cake. It's easy. It's all figured out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if obviously if I, if I knew the answer to that, I would be placing some bets right now mm-hmm. on, in the market. I mean, my, my sense is you, know, you could always see a boomerang effect, but I think the personalization of the messaging and the micro advertising, my sense is that's only going to continue to increase the desire and the need for the personalization of the communication with brands is going to increase. I don't know where that leads to, but we certainly are making a significant investment and have made a significant investment on the technology side. We have our own DMP and we're we're really trying to think through 
you know, how do we make the experience about you? And if you follow that all the way down through the funnel, there are endless opportunities for you to dial in the relevancy of the engagement and the experience and leveraging not just the qualitative research, but the quantitative data to tell you how effective you're being at that engagement. And so I don't think we've landed the plane in terms of of how dialed in that communication and experience from brands to consumers is going to be yet. And I think that's incredibly invigorating. It's a massive, massive challenge. But I think if it doesn't scare you a little bit, but also invigorate you at the same time, I think you're probably in the wrong business. <laughs> well, Eric, thank you so much for coming back on the show today. I loved it. Thanks for the time. Marketing Today is brought to you by Atomic. Atomic focuses on unleashing the growth potential for clients we serve. Atomic is a strategic consultancy specializing in business, marketing, brand, and innovation. Our singular goal is to help you accelerate your efforts with the right mix of expertise, analysis, and creativity. Check us out at Atomic.com. A-T-O-M-C-K dot com. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with project management by Sarah Williams, audio production by Aaron Campbell, writing and editing by Kevin Greeley, social media support by Megan Woods, art and graphic design by Sarah Dell. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. We love to hear from listeners at info at atomic, A-T-O-M-C-K dot com. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today.